So, you enjoyed Vincent Price going all style and sort of minimal personal restraint, at least as facial and verbal gesticulation is concerned, while the aesthetics went full tilt stylistically wild in a spooky but gory but somehow also kinda cozy and old-fashioned way in the abominable Dr. Fives movies? Well, how'd you like to try the exact literal opposite of that? It's a grave tale, Snipe, and difficult to write, but I'm sure you can rise to the occasion. <laughs> Dragon wing of night o'erspreads the earth. My half supped spear that frankly would have fed, pleased with this dainty bait, thus goes to bed. <laughs> Theater of Blood isn't the first, last, or probably best remembered of the classic horror stars playing themed serial killers as meta riffs on their stature in popular culture features unleashed in the wake of the Dr. Fives movies, but it might be the most interesting for the sheer brutality and nastiness of it matched against the over-the-top nature of the premise, and literally the only one actor could possibly make this work nature of the premise, which features Vincent Price as Edward Lionheart, a failed actor who goes on a killing spree against pretentious theater critics inspired by the most brutal death scenes from the works of William Shakespeare. It's a movie. Any good? Very good. It hey. won the Academy Award. Oh, for what? For best movie ever made. Right from the jump, this guy gets lured by the police to supposedly help oversee the eviction of some homeless drug addicts who've taken up residence in a condemned theater, only to find himself made the star attraction in a very literal reenactment of the death scene from Julius Caesar. <laughs> of earth, that I am meek and gentle with these butchers. It's you, but you're dead. No. No, another critical miscalculation on your part, dear boy. Okay, so everybody got the basic idea here? Well, hope so, because this is another one that kicks off in media res and only gradually explains what's actually happening to whom, by whom, and why the closer it gets to the ending. Yes, well, when I see five weirdos dressed in togas stabbing a guy in the middle of the park in full view of a hundred people, I shoot the bastards. That's my policy. That was a Shakespeare in the Park production of Julius Caesar, you moron produced by Harbor Productions and Cinnamon rather than the international horror mainstays like AIP or even British specialists like Hammer or Amicus, and often called a personal favorite of Price's, possibly just for the fact that he got to perform a bunch of classic Shakespeare standards that he'd always wanted to do on screen but could never get cast in the full versions of. This came out one year after Dr. Fives Rises Again and sort of feels like a spiritual sequel but also like a thematic inversion. Though like that predecessor, it once again starts off with a killing spree already underway and expects us to just catch up. The better you know your Shakespeare and or your inside baseball jokes about the shifting power dynamics of the English stage scene of the early 1970s, the further ahead you're gonna be of the rest of the audience, at least in terms of the gimmicks. Juliet, so much pasta bazool, Romeo doesn't want her anymore! Ha ha ha! tough crowd! They're booing Shakespeare! Which guess does mean that the non-murder parts of this deliver the very funny spectacle of the various cops and detectives sheepishly admitting that, eh, you know, they probably should know, but don't really remember their Shakespeare all that well from school, and then having to read through, like, the cliff notes as part of their investigation. Because, yeah, this wasn't fucking around. Our premise here is Scream, but for theater nerds, but also instead of hating random high school kids, it hates theater critics. Uh, what's the next murder, Inspector? Intended murder, you mean, Sergeant? It's Titus Andronicus. A couple of chaps are mutilated and beheaded. You know, they're stabbed and thrown in a pit. And to cap it all, some queen is made eat her children, bait in the pie. One always felt that you were striving to be complimentary, oh, that's but not always complimentary. You know, critics make errors. After all, we're all human. An opinion I find myself incapable of sharing. Yeah, okay, let's back up again. Like I said, as part of how proto-slasher movies like this and the Five Cycle held the audience interest, is that the killings start right away. We figure out the killer's theme as the investigation does, and really only find out why they're doing this to put all the stakes at full blast right at the finish. But for our purpose here, on Schlocktober, the eventual setup is that Price's Edward Lionheart was an aging star of traditional British theater scene who had been long criticized as an over-actor to marry to the classical stage, only performing Shakespeare and, it's later implied, rejecting the newer modern method 
method acting or Stanislavski system that had come to dominate his craft in the 20th century. I understand that the greatest actor of all time never earned your approval for one single performance. Never. Not one good review. Edwina, in his entire career, your father refused to appear in anything but Shakespeare. A truly great actor illuminates the present as well as the past. I attacked your father because I thought I could goad him into the 20th century. What do you want, Devlin? After having expected to be finally awarded a British Theatre Critics Association Best Actor Prize for a self-produced, self-starring run of Shakespeare productions he'd intended as the crowning run of his career, only to see it instead given to an unseen by us in the audience rising star of the method scene, Lionheart snaps and confronts the critics group at their after party. This year my season of Shakespeare was the shining jewel in the crown of the immortal bard. Quite insane. He must be drunk. But you, with your overweening malice, give the award to a twitching, mumbling boy who can barely grunt his way through an incomprehensible performance. Only to snap again when they take the occasion to mock him and supposedly takes his own life. There's the respect that makes calamity. So long life! <laughs> I gotta admit, every movie that comes after this and stole the Shakespeare quoting villain gimmick kinda diluted it, but as screenwriting cheats go, we don't have to write good dialogue, we'll just write an excuse in the plot for our character to quote the greatest dialogue ever written is a really good cheat code. Be, or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing emblem to die to sleep no more. Now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by the sun of York. If it's 400 years old, that means legally all his stuff is out of copyright. What do you say? It's free. But yeah, the rest of this you can probably guess. Lionheart didn't die and was instead nursed back to health by a community of homeless meth drinkers. Uh, that was a particularly tragic subset of addiction that mostly existed in the early to mid 20th century urban UK that involved drinking denatured alcohol, AKA rubbing alcohol, ethanol, etc. It's as dark as you're thinking. Oh, brave new world that had such lovely creatures in it whom he has assembled into his personal theater company for his now unfolding revenge scheme, using his skills at acting, costuming, makeup, knowledge of Shakespeare's most gruesome plays, etc., to exact brutal vengeance on the critics who humiliated him. So we get that stabbing from Caesar, the horse dragging from Troilus and Cressida, the beheading from Cymbeline, drowning in a cask of wine from Richard III, tricking a guy into strangling his own wife because that's the reference to Othello, electrocution because that counts as burning Joan of Arc and Henry VI Part One, which is kind of a reach and I think they mostly wanted an excuse for Price to do a whole shtick in this hairdresser outfit. Hello. I'm Butch. Hey, dishy, dishy hair. <laughs> Can't wait to get my hands on it. Even the pound of flesh from Merchant of Venice. It was a pound exactly, was it not? A pound, no more, no less. This is two ounces over. And before you bring it up. There is no murder in the Merchant of Venice. Uh, excuse me, Inspector. It's just a ride for Mr. Devlin. What's in the box? What's in the fucking box? It's Lionheart, all right. Only he would have the temerity to rewrite Shakespeare. Oh, and he also does the pies from Titus Andronicus that used to be one of the more obscure Shakespeare references, but now everyone knows it because of the Julie Tamer movie and that one South Park episode. But instead of feeding a critic his kids, he uses the guy's two poodles. Two dogs. Two pies. We knew that Monsieur would be home which feels like the only thing that they wouldn't be able to do in a Today version of this movie, which, you know, I'm supposed to say that's hypocritical, but I honestly don't feel like it is. I, I kind of agree with James from the Bucket of Blood review over on Cinemassacre. Kill all the humans you want. It always bugs me when movies kill off animals. Like, this is the one thing that feels a little beyond the pale. Anyway, Lionheart also recreates the duel from Romeo and Juliet on his main nemesis so he can monologue more. Even an unpolished oaf like you must be familiar with the duel scene. 
but leaves him alive so he can do the blinding from King Lear in order to force him to admit that they were wrong about his talents after all. But things there go awry, and look, how did you think something like this was going to go, ultimately? My daughter. How does my royal lord? How fares your majesty? Howl! 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 Oh, you are men of stone! There he is! Had I your tongues and eyes? I'd use them so that heaven's vault should crack! Where those lines from King Lear? Yeah. Yes, it was a fascinating performance. But of course, he was madly overacting as usual. But you must admit, he did know how to make an exit. That's Ian Henry as the Survivor critic and Diana Rigg as Lionheart's daughter and accomplice. They were both OG cast members of the original TV Avengers series. There's a lot of really good actors in this given the nature of the material. Uh, the director Douglas Hickox once said that it was one of the easiest jobs he ever had because there were so many great actors in the movie. All he had to do as director was open the dressing room door and let the cameras go. Oh, and uh, Rigg also said she thought this was her best movie, period. Lionheart, think of your daughter. Think of what you've done to her with this insane vendetta of yours. My daughter? What have I done to you, my daughter? Good my lord, you have begot me, bred me, loved me. I return those duties back as our right fit. Tell Cersei. I want her to know it was me. Viewed in modern context, Theater of Blood is probably most noteworthy for the novelty of the premise. You don't really need to know more than the gimmick of Shakespeare-themed serial killer versus critics to know whether or not you're going to like this, and how much fun it is to watch Price give five or six actual award-worthy Shakespearean monologue readings in the midst of what's otherwise another nasty murder movie. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. Here under leave of Brutus and the rest, come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. But my ongoing takeaway is that especially if you watch it right after the more fanciful and colorful Fives movies, what a gnarly, nasty, grimy, unrepentantly dark and devoid of even mild, whimsy piece of work it is. There's not even a tiny bit of stylization to anything that isn't meant to be part of the decaying and decrepit theater dress business that Lionheart's crew makes their whole aesthetic. The cinematography dips into handheld and verite mode a lot, and the overall tone is an unrelenting upfront, what do you want? This is the tail end of Heat Administration England tour of Londonian misery porn. But it's also the rare horror film where everyone is completely unsympathetic, except for the dogs. I feel bad for the two dogs still. Like on a meta level, it's fun to ironically root for Lionheart because he's a fun slasher antagonist and especially if you also find method acting tiresome and yes because it's really Vincent Price winking back at the audience and getting some measure of vicarious revenge for being underappreciated and called an overactor by his real life critics. How many actors have you destroyed as you destroyed me? Ah! What do you know of the blood, sweat and toil of a theatrical production? Ah! Of the dedication of the men and the women in the noblest profession of all? Ah! How could you know, you talentless fools who spew vitriol on the creative efforts of others because you lack the ability to create yourselves? But, you know, character-wise, when it's all revealed, he really is just this petty dude who cares way too much about what his own critics thought, and the critics, meanwhile, are these awful elitist snobs who look down on actual artists and are sleazy to their assistants, and yeah, some of them really have this coming. It's a really profoundly apocalyptic, cynical vision of its own tiny, insular world where a creature like Lionheart is almost doing everyone a favor, burning it all down and taking himself out with it. Come fire, consume this petty world.
and in its ashes let my memory lie. But it's also a lot of fun in its own very, very dark way. And if you're even a little bit of a theater person and you've never seen it, yeah, fix that yesterday. One is irresistibly reminded of a ham sandwich. My reputation. Park villain, I will grind your bones to dust. <laughs>